The Religion of Islam Presented by the Quran and Sunnah Part 8 B. The Unlawful and Prohibited Things First, polytheism, devoting any form of servitude to other than Allah Almighty. Examples include prostrating to other than Allah, invoking other than Allah and asking Him for the fulfillment of needs, offering sacrifices to other than Allah, or devoting any form of servitude to other than Allah. The invoked one may be alive or dead, and it may be a grave, an idol, a stone, a tree, a king, a prophet, a pious person, an animal, or the like. All of this falls under polytheism which Allah does not forgive unless the perpetrator repents and reverts to Islam. Allah Almighty says, Allah does not forgive that anything from his creation should be associated to him. Besides this and disbelief, he pardons the disobedience of whomever he wills, out of his bounty. Or he punishes those he wills among them according to their disobedience, out of his perfect justice. Whoever worships others next to Allah has committed a terrible sin, which is not forgiven if someone dies still doing it. Surat Anissa, 48 A Muslim worship none but Allah, invokes none but Allah, and humbly submits to none but Him. Allah Almighty says, Say, O Messenger, my prayer and sacrifice is for Allah and in His name, not for anyone else. My life and death is only for Allah, the Lord of all creation, and no one else has any share in that for me. He, may he be glorified, has no partner. There is no one else worthy of worship besides him. Allah has instructed me to accept this pure monotheism, and I am the first of those who acknowledge him in this nation. Surat al Anam, 162-163 one of the forms of polytheism is to believe that Allah has a wife or a son far exalted be he above that, or to believe that there are other gods disposing of the affairs of this universe. If there were numerous gods in the heavens and the earth, they would have been ruined, due to the gods disputing in the kingdom. But the reality is not like this. So Allah, Lord of the throne, is pure of the lie the idolaters describe him with, namely that he has partners, Surat al Anbiya, 22. Second, magic, divination, and claiming to know the unseen. Magic and divination are disbelief. Indeed, a magician cannot be a magician except through his connection with the devils and worshipping them apart from Allah. Hence, it is not permissible for a Muslim to go to magicians or soothsayers or believe their claims about knowing the unseen or any event they allege will happen in the future. Allah Almighty says, O Messenger, say, the Gabe, unseen, is not known by the angels in the heavens or the people on earth. However, Allah alone is the one who knows it. And nobody in the heavens or the earth knows when they will be raised for recompense besides Allah. Surat and Naml, 65 He also says, He, may he be glorified, is the knower of the Gabe, unseen, all of it. Nothing of it is hidden from him. He does not disclose his gave to anyone, but keeps it in his exclusive knowledge. Except for a messenger whom he, may he be glorified, selects and then discloses to him what he wishes. He sends guards from the angels to go before the messenger and protect him so that no one besides the messenger gains access to this. Surat al Jin, 26-27 Third, Injustice Injustice is a broad term that comprises many evil acts and bad traits that impact people. Falling under this is injustice to oneself, injustice to others, injustice to society, and injustice even to enemies. Allah Almighty says, O you who believe in Allah and His Messenger and follow His laws, uphold Allah's rights over you, seeking His pleasure. Be witnesses for justice and not for oppression. The hatred for a people should not make you leave justice. Justice is a requirement with a friend, as well as with an enemy, so be just with both. Justice is closer to the fear of Allah, and oppression is closer to disrespect against Him. Be mindful of Allah by fulfilling His instructions and avoiding His prohibitions. Allah knows what you do. Nothing of your actions is hidden from Him, and He will repay you accordingly. Surat al maida 8 Allah Almighty informs us that He does not love the unjust. In a kutsi, divine, hadith, Allah Almighty said, O my servants, I have forbidden injustice for myself and made it forbidden amongst you, so, do not wrong one another. Narrated by a Muslim. In another hadith, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, Support your brother whether he is oppressor or oppressed. 
A man said, O Messenger of Allah, I should support him if he is oppressed, but how should I support him if he is oppressor? The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, Support him by preventing him from oppression. Narrated by Muslim in the Book of Righteousness, Maintaining Ties, and Ethics, Chapter, Prohibition of Oppression, 16132. Fourth, Killing the Soul Made Inviolable by Allah Without Right This is a serious crime in the religion of Islam for which Allah Almighty threatens with painful punishment and has prescribed the toughest penalties in this world. Namely killing the killer unless the murdered person's heirs pardon the murderer. Allah Almighty says, Due to Cain's murder of his brother, I informed the Israelites that any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people, since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. Whoever refrains from killing a person whose soul I have made sacred, and regards it to be forbidden to kill such a person, it is as if he has given life to all people. Because in such an action lies the safety of all people. My messengers brought to the Israelites clear signs and evidences. Despite this many of them overstepped my limits by committing sins and going against the messengers. Surat al maida 32 He also says, If anyone kills a believer, deliberately intending to do so, his recompense will be held to live there eternally. Allah will be angry with him, distance him from his mercy, and will prepare for him a great punishment for committing such a serious crime. The belief of the Al-As-Sunnah wal Jamaa is that if the killer is a believing Muslim, he will not literally remain in hell eternally. But he will be punished in it for a long period and will then be removed from there through Allah's grace. Surat Anisa, 93 Fifth, encroaching upon people's properties, be it by theft, usurpation, bribery, fraud, or the like. Allah Almighty says, as for those who are caught stealing, those in authority are to cut off the right hand of the male and female thief as a punishment from Allah for the crime of wrongfully taking people's wealth, and to serve as a lesson and deterrent for them, as well as others. Allah is mighty and nothing can overpower His decree. He is wise in His decree and legislation. Surat al maida 38 He also says, Do not take each other's wealth unjustly robbing it or taking it by force or by cheating, and then making it a legal dispute in order to obtain others' wealth wrongfully when you know that Allah has prohibited that. Committing a sin knowingly is the worst of things and has the greatest of punishments. Surat al-Baqarah, 188 He also says, Those who take the property of orphans and spend it wrongly and unjustly, they only swallow fire into themselves, they will burn in the fire of hell on the day of judgment. Surat Anissa 10 Islam strongly opposes encroachment upon people's properties and gives stern warnings about this. It prescribes harsh penalties against the perpetrators of this and similar crimes that disturb the order and security of society. Sixth, cheating, treachery, and betrayal in all dealings, such as buying, selling, covenants, and the like. These are reprehensible traits that Islam forbids and warns people against. Allah Almighty says, Destruction and loss be for those who give short measure. They are the ones who, when they measure for themselves from others, they take their full right without any reduction. But when they measure or weigh for people, they reduce the measurement and weight. This was the practice of the people of Medina at the time the Prophet, peace be on him, migrated to them. Do these people who do this evil act not know that they will resurrect it before Allah? For the reckoning and recompense on a day that is great because of the trials and horrors it contains. Surat al-Mutafifin, 1-5 The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever cheats us is not one of us. Narrated by a Muslim Allah Almighty says, Allah does not like the treacherous and sinful. Do not argue on behalf of any person who commits a sin denying it until you come to know more about the matter. Allah does not love these deceitful liars. Surat Anissa, 107 Seventh, Attacking People's Honor By cursing, reviling, backbiting, slandering, envying, distrusting, spying, mocking, and the like. 
Islam is keen to establish a clean and pure society that abounds in love, brotherliness, harmony, and cooperation. To this end, it firmly combats all social ills that lead to the disintegration of society and the appearance of rancor, hatred, and selfishness among its members. Allah Almighty says, O those who have faith in Allah and act upon what he has legislated, a group of you should not mock another, perhaps those that have been mocked are better according to Allah. True consideration is only for what Allah considers. And a group of women should not mock another group of women, perhaps the group mocked it is better according to Allah. Do not taunt the souls of your brothers, because they are like your own souls. And do not call others with names they do not like as was the case of a few of the and before the arrival of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. Whoever does that is a wrongdoer, and deviance is a very bad trait after having brought faith. Whoever does not repent from these sins are oppressing themselves by placing themselves in situations of destruction due to the sins they commit. O oh, those who have faith in Allah and act upon what he has legislated, stay away from most suspicions which are not based on causes and indications that give them credence, because some suspicions are sinful, like suspecting one who is apparently pious. And do not pursue the faults of believers behind their backs, nor mention another in a manner he dislikes, because mentioning him in a manner he dislikes is like eating his flesh whilst he is dead. Do any of you wish to eat the flesh of his dead brother? Therefore, abhor backbiting him because it is like that. And be mindful of Allah by fulfilling his commands and refrain from that which he has prohibited. Indeed, Allah forgiving of those of his servants who repent, merciful to them. Surat al-Hujurat, 11-12 Islam also strongly combats racial and class-based discrimination between members of society. In its eyes, all are equal. There is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab or for a white over a black except in terms of religiousness and piety. Everyone equally vies in doing good deeds. Allah Almighty says, O people, indeed, I have created you from one male, your father Adam, and one female, your mother Eve. Therefore, your lineage is the same, so some of you should not take pride in lineage over others. Then, I made you into many nations and dispersed tribes, so that you may recognize one another, not so that you take pride in them, because pride can only be due to Allah consciousness. Indeed, the most noble from among you according to Allah is the one who is most mindful of him. Indeed, Allah is aware of your conditions, knowing of what levels of perfection and deficiency you are on, nothing is hidden from him. Surat al-Hujurat, 13. 8. Gambling, Drinking Alcohol, and Drug Abuse Allah Almighty says, O you who have faith in Allah and follow His Messenger, intoxicants that affect the mind, gambling with a consideration from both sides. Stone altars on which the idolaters offer sacrifices, or which they erect for worship, and arrows by which they use to draw lots, these are all acts of sin that Satan has made attractive. Avoid such acts, so that you successfully achieve the paradise that you desire and are saved from the fire that you fear. By making alcohol and gambling seem attractive, Satan's only intention is to create hatred between hearts and to turn them away from Allah's remembrance and from the prayer. Will you, O believers, leave these evil acts? Without doubt, leaving these acts is the right thing to do, so avoid them. Surat al-Ma'idah, 90-91 Ninth, Consuming the flesh of dead animals, blood, and pork and all filthy and harmful things to people. This also applies to sacrifices offered to other than Allah Almighty who says, O you who have faith in Allah and follow His Messenger, consume the good things that Allah has provided and allowed for you. And be thankful to Allah, outwardly and inwardly, for the overwhelming blessings He has given you. Part of being thankful to him is acting with complete devotion to him and not going against him if you truly worship him alone and do not worship anything besides him. Allah has only forbidden you from consuming that which died without being sacrificed according to the sacred law and having its blood flow. The meat of pigs and what is had other than Allah's name mentioned over it when it was sacrificed. Yet if someone is forced to eat something of these forbidden types and does not sin by eating it when they are not in need, nor do they go beyond the limit of what is necessary. Then they have done no wrong and will receive no punishment. Allah is forgiving and compassionate to whomever repents to him, and it is from his mercy that he overlooks the eating of forbidden things when it is necessary.
Surat al-Bakara, 172-173 Tenth, Adultery and Sodomy Adultery is a malicious deed that ruins morals and societies and leads to mingling of lineages, loss of families, and absence of proper upbringing. Illegitimate children feel the bitterness of this crime and the hatred of society. Allah Almighty says, Do not go near adultery, for it is indeed a shameful act and an evil way. Be careful of fornication and avoid things that prompt it. It is extremely detestable and bad path to traverse as it leads to the mixing of lineages and punishment from Allah. Surat al-Isra, 32 Adultery causes spread of sexual diseases that destroy the fabric of society. The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said. Immorality does not prevail among any people to the extent that they commit it openly except that plague and diseases that did not exist among their predecessors will spread among them. Narrated by Ibn Majah in the Book of Trials, Chapter, Penalties, 2.13.33, and Al-Albani judged it as Hassan, Sound, Sahih Ibn Majah, 2.370. Islam, therefore, instructs us to block all means leading to adultery. For example, it commands Muslims to lower their gaze, for an unlawful look constitutes the first step towards adultery. And Islam also commands women to wear hijab and modest clothing and stick to chastity, thus preserving society from this vice. On the other hand, Islam urges and encourages people to get married and promises reward even for this sexual pleasure that the husband and wife engage in. As this helps establish chaste and dignified families that are well qualified for the successful upbringing of today's child and tomorrow's man. 11th, Consuming Usury Usury damages the economy, and it involves exploitation of people's need for money, whether for doing business or fulfilling basic living needs. In usury, money is lent to someone for a fixed period of time in return for an increase to be paid along with the repayment of the debt. A usurer exploits the poor person's need for money and burdens him with accumulative debts added to the original amount. A usurer takes advantage of the needs of traders, manufacturers, farmers, and others who affect the economy. He exploits their need for cash and imposes upon them an extra amount of the profits, whereas he only lends them without sharing the risk of stagnation or loss. If such a trader incurs a loss, debts accumulate on him, and the usurer crushes him. If they were partners, however, sharing profit and loss, one with his effort and the other with his money, as instructed by Islam. The wheel of the economy would keep moving for the benefit of society. Allah Almighty says, O you who have faith in Allah and follow his messenger, fear Allah by fulfilling his instructions and avoiding his prohibitions, and do not demand any usury owed to you that remains with people. If you truly have faith in Allah and in his prohibitions. If you do not obey the sacred law, then be aware and certain of war with Allah and his messenger. If you repent to Allah and leave usury, then you can keep the initial amount that you had given as a loan from your capital. In a manner that does not wrong anyone by taking more than your initial capital and does not wrong you by making you receive less than it. If the person from whom you demand your debt is in hard times and is unable to repay the debt, then refrain from asking until he is able to obtain money and then pay the debt. And to give charity to him by not demanding the debt or giving up a part of it is better for you, if you knew its worth in the sight of Allah. You read Al-Baqarah, 278 to 280. Twelfth, Avarice and Stinginess. It denotes selfishness and self-love. A miser hoards wealth and refuses to pay his zakat to the poor and the needy, denying his society and rejecting the principle of cooperation and brotherliness which Allah and his messenger commanded. Allah Almighty says, Those who are not generous with the blessings Allah has given them out of his kindness, not fulfilling Allah's right with it, should not think that this is good for them. Rather, it is bad for them, because whatever they are miserly with will be hung around their necks on the day of judgment as a punishment. To Allah alone belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. He is the living after all his creation has passed away. Allah is well aware of the good and evil that you do, and will reward you accordingly. Surat al-Imran, 180 Thirteenth, Lying and False Testimony We have previously cited the Prophet's hadith. Indeed, lying leads to immorality, and immorality leads to hellfire, and a man would continue to lie and be keen on lying until he is recorded in the sight of Allah as a liar. 
one of the types of reprehensible lying is false testimony. The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, went to great lengths to keep people away from it and warn them of its evil consequences. He said to his companions loudly, Shall I inform you of the gravest major sins? Associating partners with Allah and undutifulness to one's parents. Then, he sat up after being in a state of reclining and added, And beware of the false testimony. And beware of the false testimony. Narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. He kept repeating his statement so as to warn the Ummah against committing this sin. Fourteenth, Arrogance, Self-Conceit, Self-Admiration, and Vanity Arrogance, self-conceit, and vanity are ugly and reprehensible traits frowned upon in the religion of Islam. Allah Almighty informs us that he does not love the arrogant. He says about them, is there not in hell an abode for the arrogant? On the day of resurrection, you will see those who told lies about Allah by attributing a partner and son to him, their faces blackened, as a sign of their wretchedness. Is there not a place in hell for those who are too proud to have faith in Allah and his messengers? Indeed, there is a place for them in it. Surat Az Zumer, 60 A self-conceited, self-admiring, and an arrogant person is hated by Allah Almighty and hated by people. See, Repentance of Prohibited Things A Muslim should be so careful to avoid these major sins and aforementioned prohibitions, for he will be recompensed in the hereafter for any act he does. With reward for goodness and punishment for evil. But if a Muslim falls into any of these prohibitions, he should hasten to repent of it and turn to his Lord and ask for his forgiveness. If his repentance is sincere, he should give up the sin, feel regretful for doing it, resolve not to repeat it, and if the sin involves injustice to someone, he should return the right to its owner or ask him for pardon. This way, his repentance will be a true one and Allah will accept it and forgive his sin. Indeed, a person who truly repents of a sin is like one who has not sinned in the first place and he should often ask Allah for forgiveness. Indeed, all Muslims should frequently ask for Allah's forgiveness for their misdeeds, small or great. Allah Almighty says, Sad face I said, Seek forgiveness from your Lord, indeed, he is most forgiving. Then I said to them, O my people, Seek the forgiveness of your Lord by turning to him. Indeed, he, may he be glorified, is the oft-forgiving of the sins of whichever of his servants repents to him. Suratna 10 Frequently asking Allah for forgiveness and returning to him in repentance is a trait of the humble believers. Allah Almighty says, Sad face say, Allah says, Say, O Messenger, to my servants who have gone beyond the limit against themselves by ascribing partners to Allah and committing sins. Do not lose hope of Allah's mercy and of his forgiveness for your sins. Allah forgives all the sins of those who repent to him. He is the forgiving towards the sins of those who repent and the merciful towards them. Return to your Lord by repentance and righteous actions and submit to him before the punishment comes to you on the day of resurrection. Then you will not find anyone from your idols and families to help you by rescuing you from the punishment. Surat Az Zumer, 53-54 D. The Muslims care about the authentic transmission of this religion. Since it is the Prophet's statements, actions, and approvals that clarify Allah's words and explain the commands and prohibitions in Islam. The Muslims paid great attention to the authenticity of the transmission of the hadiths reported from the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And they exerted tremendous efforts in ridding these hadiths of additions that were not said by the Prophet and in revealing the statements falsely attributed to him. To this end, they laid down the most accurate rules and systems to be observed in the transmission of these hadiths from one generation to another. We will briefly talk about this field of knowledge, the science of hadith, to make the reader aware of what made the Muslim Ummah distinct from other religions. As Allah enabled this Ummah to preserve their religion pure and untainted by lies and superstitions over the ages. Transmitting the speech of Allah and the statements of the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, relied upon two main ways. Memorization and Writing Down The early Muslims were among the best people in accurate memorization and broad comprehension because of their clear minds and sharp memories. This is a clear fact to anyone who reads their biographies. A companion would hear a hadith right from the Prophet's mouth and memorize it well and then convey it to someone from the following generation, Tabi'i. 
who in turn would memorize and convey it to those after him. In this way, the chain of transmitting hadiths would continue until it reached the scholar of hadith, who would write them down, memorize them, and collect them in a book. Then, he would read out the book to his students, who would in turn memorize and record these hadiths and then read them out to their students and so on. The cycle kept going until these books reached all the subsequent generations in this way and manner. Hence, any hadith from the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is never accepted without knowing its chain of narrators who reported it to us. Based on this, there emerged another science that distinguished the Muslim Ummah from all other nations. Namely, ilmarijal, knowledge of men, or ilm aljar wa atadil, science of criticism and commendation. This science is meant for knowing the conditions of those narrators who reported the Prophet's hadiths to us. So, it examines their biographies, their birth and death dates, their sheikhs and their students, and it documents their contemporary scholars, how perfect and accurate their memorization was. Their truthfulness of speech, and other things of interest to the scholar of hadith for the purpose of verifying the authenticity of a given hadith reported through a certain chain of narrators. This science is uniquely adopted by this ummah out of the Muslim's keenness on the authenticity of any statement attributed to the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Never in history, from its very beginning to this day, have people seen such huge efforts and care about the statement of any person as they have seen with regard to the Prophet's hadiths. It is a broad science written down in books totally concerned with the narration of hadiths and containing detailed biographies for thousands of narrators for the sole reason that they were the intermediaries in the transmission of the Prophet's hadiths to the succeeding generations. This science was not established in favor of anyone, but as a balance in terms of the accuracy of criticism. It labels the liar a liar and the truthful a truthful, and likewise it classifies those with poor or strong memorization as such. To this end, they followed the most precise rules ever known to the specialists in this field. They would not consider any hadith authentic unless its chain of transmission was connected, and its narrators were marked by integrity, truthfulness, and good memorization and accuracy. The other thing in the science of hadith is the multiplicity of the chains of transmission for the same hadith. This means that a hadith is reported from the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, through more than one chain of narrators. So, one hadith may have two, three, or four isnads, chains of transmission, and sometimes ten or even more. The more the chains of transmission are, the stronger the hadith is and the more authentically attributed to the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, it is. A hadith narrated by more than ten reliable narrators at all levels of transmission is called mutawatir, collectively transmitted, and this constitutes the best type of transmission among Muslims. The greater the significance of an issue in Islam is, like the pillars of this religion, the more the mutawatir narrations and isnads about it are, and vice versa. When a certain matter falls under secondary or recommended issues, there is less attention paid to it and fewer isnads for the hadiths dealing with it. The greatest attention paid by Muslims in terms of narration and the accuracy of transmission was devoted to the Noble Quran. This noble book received utmost attention represented by writing it down and memorizing it, as well as perfecting its words, articulation, and recitation. It was transmitted via isnads through thousands and thousands over the successive generations. Hence, it has not been subject to any distortion or alteration over the years. The Mus'haf, hard copy of the Quran, recited in Morocco is the same as the one recited in the East or in any region around the globe, in confirmation of the verse that says, It is we who have sent down the reminder, and it is we who will preserve it. Surat al hijr 9 I alone revealed this Quran to the heart of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a reminder for people. I will guard the Quran from anything being added to it or subtracted from it, or anything in it being exchanged or altered. Surat al hijr 9 E. A Last Word This is the religion of Islam which declares Allah Almighty as the one and only God and whose motto is there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. This is Islam which Allah has approved as a religion for his servants. Today I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen Islam as your religion, Surat al-Ma'ida, 3. This is the religion of Islam other than which Allah Almighty accepts no religion from anyone.
Anyone who seeks a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted from him, and in the hereafter he will be among the losers. Surat al-Imran, 85. This is the religion of Islam which if one believes in and acts rightly, one will be among the blissful winners in paradise.as for those who believe and do righteous deeds. They will have gardens of paradise as a dwelling place, abiding therein forever, never desiring to leave. Those who have faith in Allah and do good actions will have the highest of gardens as a place to honor them, staying therein forever, they will not want to move from there. As no reward can come close to it. Surat al Kaf, 107 to 108. This is the religion of Islam, which does not exclusively belong to a certain group of people or a specific ethnicity. Rather, whoever believes in this religion and calls people to it becomes one of its worthy followers and the most honorable in the sight of Allah Almighty. Indeed, the most noble of you before Allah is the most righteous among you. Surat al Hujurat, 13. We should bring to the reader's notice certain matters that act as a barrier between people and this religion and prevent them from embracing it. First, ignorance about the religion of Islam in terms of its creed, sharia, and ethics. People tend to be hostile towards what they do not know. So, the one interested in knowing Islam should read and read and read until he gets acquainted with this religion from its original sources. He should read with an unbiased and fair mind that seeks only for the truth. Second, fanaticism for the religion, habits, and culture in which one has grown up without thinking deeply and deliberately about whether or not this religion is true. Driven by nationalistic fanaticism, one tends to reject any other religion than the religion of one's forefathers. Indeed, fanaticism blinds eyes, deafens ears, and stiffens minds, preventing one from thinking freely and without bias, and thus one cannot distinguish the light from darkness. Third, personal whims and desires, which drive people's thinking and will towards what they want and ruin them without them knowing it. They prevent people from accepting the truth and submitting to it. Fourth, the existence of some mistakes and aberrations among some Muslims, which are falsely ascribed to Islam itself, whereas this religion is totally innocent of them. It should be known to everyone that the religion of Allah is not responsible for people's errors. The easiest way for knowing the truth and reaching guidance is to turn towards Allah Almighty with our hearts. Humbly imploring Him to guide us to the straight path and the true religion which He loves and approves, and through which one attains a good life in this world and eternal bliss in the hereafter. Never followed by misery or hardship. And we should know that Allah Almighty responds to the call of a supplicant when He invokes Him as He says, When my slaves ask you concerning me, I am indeed near. I respond to the call of the supplicant when he calls upon me, so they should respond to me and believe in me, so that they may be guided. If they ask you, O Prophet, about how close Allah is and about his answering of prayers, Allah is close to them and knows everything about them. He hears their prayer, and they do not need intermediaries or to raise their voices. Allah responds to the call of whoever calls him sincerely, praying to him. So, let them be devoted to him and his sacred law, firm in their faith, as that is the best route to Allah's response perhaps in that way they might be rightly guided in worldly and sacred matters. Surat al-Baqarah, 186